Thank you, Barry, Barry for, for being with us tonight. Uh, this is your second exhibition with us. We opened the gallery three years ago with your exhibition entitled The Tour. Uh, and I'd like to talk about just a few things about your practice in general, about photography in Cairo, and the work that we're seeing now in the gallery. So just in terms of your general practice, um, it's worth noting that making photographs has been very central to what you do uh, since you began working in the press in 81 and throughout all of your editorial and commercial work over the 40 plus years, you've always maintained a parallel artistic production. So yet along the way, you've been very active in other areas such as uh, research in history of photography, uh, especially focused on the region uh, collecting photographic collections, writing articles about photography, publishing books about photography, teaching workshops and at university, curating or co-curating exhibitions. So that's a lot of activities in parallel to shooting the work, either commercial or editorial or artistic. So that's very many things over a number of decades. Maybe you can Tell us how these activities have informed or shaped your art production, and maybe you can point to uh, one or two of specific influences that shaped your work. Well, thank you for such a nice introduction. I don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd just like to say that I've gotten a hoarse voice over the past two weeks. So bear with me. Um, it's a little bit raspy, but I'll try my best and make it short. Um, you're correct that the influence of historical photographs and archival research has been really central to my interest. And that has translated into two big series that I did. One was Comparative Views of Egypt, which was this one. Uh, we started in 1985, and it took three years. And this uh, second one was called The Tour. And the tour wouldn't have happened without this one. Mm -hmm. So there's an evolution all stemming from uh, archival research, uh, historical photographs, particularly of the 19th century. So it's worth, sorry, just to interpret, it's worth just to repeat that the comparative views was based on some of the earliest photographers traveling in this region, like Francis Frith and Green and Sabah and all of these characters. So you came across these photographs, and so comparative views is 100 years later taken from the same viewpoint as them. That's right. I mean, you get the idea pretty quick by just looking at the cover um, then and now, right? There's been several of these then and now kind of books made. I didn't really like the, the term then and now, so I called it comparative views, but um, I'll tell you a bit how it happened, and it was a little bit of exceptional circumstances. I was injured in Beirut in 1982 and took three years to walk. And during that time, uh, I met the people at the Harvard Semitic Museum where I was recovering. And the Harvard Semitic Museum has an incredible 19th century Middle Eastern photo collection. So while well, I was on my crutches and wheeled myself over to the museum every day, I would help them catalog the collection and do things like note the process, note the dates, note the photographer, note the conditions, all the things that's required of a collection if you really wanted to do uh, you know, due diligence. And that continued for a while. And then I got to thinking about, well, once I start walking again, what am I going to do? And so 
all of that had a big effect on me. And I got the idea to do the then and now project, the comparative views. So I applied for a Fulbright, uh, which included field work and research in Egypt. I got the Fulbright. And so that was all fine and good. But to do the field work, you can't just go out of nowhere. You have to test your, your gear, you have to test your process. And this was, remember, in the early 80s. No internet, no digital, you know, this was all analog. And I decided at that time to do the work with large format camera, which was a 4x5. And the 4x5 camera on crutches is not such an interesting proposition. Am I crazy? A little bit. Maybe a little bit more driven is, the, <laughs> is, a, is a better word. But somehow, um, I had to test this equipment before coming back to Egypt and getting myself involved in this project. So I bought a lot of equipment, the 4x5 Sinar with several different lenses, and I had to test it. So where was I going to test it? For someone that was really not very able to move around, and it was right there in front of me, Harvard University. Harvard University, the oldest university in America, for sure they have a fantastic archive of photographs of their facilities, of all their buildings. So I went into their archives, and they were super nice. And they allowed me to reproduce, uh, I don't know, 50, 75 images of all their old buildings. And when you think about it, that represented what I was going to do in Egypt was primarily architecture, buildings. Okay, there were some desert scenes and some pyramid scenes, temples, but essentially it's all about architecture. So I reproduced those and I did this field work, this pilot study at Harvard, which I thought was going to come out to be maybe three weeks, one month. And it turned out to be this huge project, <laughs> much, much larger than I had ever anticipated doing. A complete project of its own. And it's called it Comparative, Comparative Views of Harvard. So you, so you came to Egypt, you did, you went around and, you know, followed a lot of these uh, photographs as, that were references. Right, to the locations. Right. So, um, so with the knowledge that the gear that I had, the process worked fine, I proved that it was good, um, I then proceeded uh, to collect a huge amount of material of the 19th century photographers in Egypt, Bonfils, Sabah, Toucan. And what was the criterion? The criterion was from the very beginning, 1839, through the 40s, through the 50s, salt print, color types, 1860s, collodion, and then into the 70s, album and prints. Right, so these 80s, are all, 90s. These are all very different uh, kinds of imagery. The, the material itself says a lot about how the photographers were actually seeing and documenting these places. That's right, there were different processes and, and so I wanted to, the criterion also included different processes, not sticking to one photographer, not sticking to collodion or a salt print or daguerreotype, no. It was to get a, several different items and representation too, not sticking just in one certain area. Location-wise, had to be, you know, St. Catherine had to be also all the temples and edifices along the Nile, because that was, after all, why the photographers came here in the first place, right? To document the edifices along the Nile. And so, was there any one uh, photographer specifically, or or a medium? 
that was employed that resonated with you most and that you see reverberating in your own work? Probably Frith. Mm -hmm. And the one of Frith that really reverberated most was the one of Dashur. Frith did this fantastic uh, landscape in 1857. He called it the Pyramid of Dashur from the East, I think. And it's just a, it's just a marvelous, uh, marvelous image. The print, the, the, the big prints that he did, uh, roughly forty by fifty centimeters, just just love. It. So um, this one, yeah, in particular, and I really liked his style. And you know that style is also since I had since I had to copy that work. That stayed with me too. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you can say that old, that old 19th century style was carried on over into the 1980s. But uh, just saying nothing about Frith, the, 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 the image of Dashur. So that image of Dashur, when the pandemic started, I had made a whole bunch of, uh, of the new ones that I made in 87. So, uh, so, so Frith, and then you made so we had various the, Frith. Yeah, so we okay. compared it, so we had a new one. I made a whole bunch of like, uh, like 20 by 25 prints of the new one. And um, decided to just color those like crazy. And just to be really, really, really uh, you know, imaginary and use my imagination. And also, my son got involved, Sammy. My wife got involved coloring, and even my grandma got involved coloring. <laughs> so maybe we could just take take a step back and 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 the the uh, the work, the body of work, comparative views. This was your second exhibition in Egypt. You had a, a first exhibition in '92, and the comparative views was '94, along with the publishing of the book, right? Um, and so. What was the audience like for you at that time? Like, how did they receive the work? Were they familiar with these photographers and these kinds of photographic practices? The history of the medium. What, how, what, can, what was going on at that time? Well, okay, the that show, uh, the comparative views that we did um, in '94. So that was at the Sony Gallery, right, mm -hmm. at AUC. And at the Sony Gallery at that time, in the Tahrir campus, that was the only photo specific, the only photo gallery in Egypt at that time. Mm -hmm. I mean, other galleries dipped their feet in it a little bit from time to time, but the Sony Gallery was it, and it was a non-commercial gallery. So what kind of audience did we get? The students, the professors, and also a lot of people that had heard about this project that came. And they you know, wanted to buy the book or wanted to see see the prints themselves. Um, but as far as the homegrown, organic community of fine art photography, it really wasn't developed on equal scale as, say, painting or sculpture in, in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Th those, those sectors had developed, but photography, no. No, there was not really, was it there a recognition that this was art photography rather than documentary? I just think that it was a, a long time in coming and, and it wasn't there yet. It hadn't arrived. Mm -hmm. You can say that it arrived maybe five, ten years ago. Okay. After all these different combination of factors led into it. I mean, the townhouse opening in 2000 and a much more private things going on rather than just solely governmental oversight of, of you know, whatever government galleries. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think the, the combination of this being part of the global audience is, you know, photography is, is expanding everywhere else. Mm -hmm. It inevitably had to expand here too. Um, now that said, when I did the show uh, of the desert in, in 96 with the Cairo Berlin Gallery, mm -hmm. does anybody remember the Cairo Berlin Gallery? Renata Jordan. She um, ran a nice little gallery just across from the Bustan Garage. 
And a lovely woman, um, so she asked me to mount a show on the desert. And actually this, show, this piece right here was one of the pieces in the show. Um, and she showed lots of different things and she was one of the first to show photography, even though she showed other things, but she was one of the first to show photography. Uh, Yusuf Nabil had a show, I think, just before mine, mm -hmm. or just after. So she was aware, she knew what was going on. Um, the difference in my production of that show, as opposed to this show, it was all analog, it was all darkroom work. And now with the possibility of pigment prints and Photoshop and doing different things, you could never do in the darkroom. So did you have this work that we have on the wall here, was that part of the show? It was all black and white. So black none black. of the colored work okay. had arrived. I hadn't really touched that yet because I didn't know Van Leo by that time. Mm -hmm. But um, it was still a pretty good show. It was all pretty small. And that was another thing too, right? Darkroom work, traditionally, you don't go so big mm -hmm. just because it's, it's difficult to do big prints. It's expensive to do big prints, mm -hmm. and it's a lot of work. So, you know, 30 by 40, maybe 40 by 50. But today, you know, in the digital world, <laughs> everybody's going so big. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that they should go big? Not everything should go big. Mm -hmm. So, um, that was a desert show at the Cairo Berlin Gallery. What, how was... How did the audience receive that? That was another two years after the Comparative View show, which was very architectural, monumental, you know, documentary-ish. Now the desert was much more of your own expression and, and, and looking at things in a different way. So it's a different kind of imagery. Uh, how, how was the audience uh, receptive to that? And was it a different audience than at the Sony Gallery? Yeah, it was definitely a different audience. Um... I must say, I didn't spend a whole lot of time at the gallery, so I can't ex answer that exactly, you know, the people. But she had, she had, a, she had a good uh, collector base. She had, um, as I said, she was very avant-garde. She, she was ahead of her time. Um, and uh, it, it was a commercial gallery. It was a commercial gallery. So this was very different than uh, exhibiting at the AUC. That's right, yeah. yeah. And she was one of the first to kind of break the mold, too. And so was the show successful commercially? I wouldn't say it was very successful because I think it was still really too early for people to process photography as being a fine art medium. You know, it was traditionally by a painting or by a sculpture, by something else, but not photography. Okay. You know, you always hear these crazy ideas like, oh yeah, I can do that, I'm going to go home and do that myself. Okay, go ahead and do it yourself. And so after all of this time doing editorial work, news, uh, commercial work, the comparative views, which was very research-based, the desert project is m a little bit more free, perhaps. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about the experience of photographing in the desert, and, you know, what's involved, and maybe choose two images in the, in the exhibition to... to shed some light about it, how, how different it was of an experience. For the, as long as I can remember shooting in the desert, um, you know, it's a really special experience. And, you know, of course, you have to respect the desert and all its you know, profound nature. But I always shot in large format. And you know when you shoot large format, you just enter into a different zone. I mean, you can imagine when you <clears throat> arrive at a scene you know there's something special about that scene. But if you're gonna shoot, say, digital, you really don't stop to think about what is the optimum place that I can put my camera to express in one, one image this scene. How can I interpret it? Different than everybody else has been here. It's a beautiful sight, but... So, so with a DSLR, kind of point of view, you just do everything and not, not stop and think. But with a large format camera, you stop and you, you, you kind of think about, well, what is it I really want to do? And you, 
do what's called pre-visualization. You pre-visualize actually what the print is going to look like. And sometimes we even bring this little, little square frame as a reminder. And you look around and take your time. And, and so a lot of times it was just um, waiting for the light. I mean, you knew, you knew that you were chasing beauty. At least I was. I mean, because um, you, you, you're looking for something interesting. And uh, for me, I was really looking for beauty, I think, in the end. And I was waiting for the right light. So uh, you, you arrive at a spot, and you know that's, that's what it's going to do. It's going to be beautiful. This one was... Uh, I don't know, you can't see it from there, I know, but this was taken in Ras Muhammad. Um, What's the title? Uh, it's called Sand, uh, Sand Ribs, and it was taken in, um, I think, 91. And uh, so <clears throat> the, we were camping and, <clears throat> and walking around and and all of a sudden, this, the top of this dune appears. And uh, on one side, you have this dark. And the other side, you have the light. Oh, it was just, just, just blew me away. So <clears throat> I was just infatuated with the scene and came back with a large format and, and did the, made the image. And uh, couldn't wait to develop that picture. It was just like tearing me up. So it takes it takes quite a, a lot of time to go and lug the tripod out and bring the camera and load it and check the light and, and do all of that. In that time, even though you're working physically, carrying and, and, and looking and thinking, there must be there must have been a, a chance to recall some of the images that you'd seen in all of this research that you've done. Yeah, I mean, because, you know, when you, when you, comp when you compose, you, you, you're actually bringing out of your brain the hundreds of thousands of images that came before you that, that have registered somewhere inside your, inside your brain somewhere. So you're getting influence from a lot of different things. I mean, how are you supposed to put it... Um, it's not just you all of a sudden uh, capture it. And, I mean, maybe with a DSL, DSLR you do, but it's, uh, I think your brain is a repository of all these images that you've seen before, and, and it has affected you. And uh, so uh, the, uh, I just wanted to explain, so that's uh, from the 90s. So from shooting in 2000, like 2000, uh, I'll point out one image uh, on the far right in the wall. There's a big dune with like a, it's like a, a cough in Arabic. Um, with lovely shadow on the right and highlight on the left. Lovely design. So that was in uh, 2007 in the empty quarter. And uh, much different, much different way of shooting. Um, Sometimes, uh, sometimes you don't have a whole lot of time, and I was I was uh, with my brother-in-law on this uh, image. We were driving around fairly quickly, and and sometimes you just have to shoot a lot, and um, just a, a different times, different uh, opportunities. So you were different somehow. Ninety-one to two thousand and seven. There's a quite a big expanse of time. A lot of things happened during that period of time. So how different were you in your own vision and creation to make this image? Well, you know, like, you can't always have the optimal conditions, right? You can't always have your 8x10 camera there with the uh, uh, Panex film that you want that with the right tripod, I mean, all those things just require so much logistical stuff. Um, and so there's always compromises. And I can say probably this is a compromise, but at the end of the day, 
really I like the image how it came out. Mm -hmm. And um, so it comes down to editing in the end, because now with the DSLR we shoot so much stuff that uh, we have to, to boil it down into what's really important. Okay, so talking about quantity, over this, these many years of, of your artistic practice, you've built several different portfolios, maybe two dozen different themes, you know, different characteristics. Uh, we can say the Desert Views, which was the earlier show we referred to. We can talk about the Cairo portfolios, the city, still life, uh, that kind of thing. We can talk about uh, the tour, which was the first show that we had here at the gallery three years ago, which was a, a montage of your own images from your own archive combined with portraits from your historical collection. So you've had all of these portfolios, all this kind of uh, different genres of work, but then you chose to hand color or to provide a, a black and white version and a hand colored version. And, and so you were offering that, that was your choice to offer that. So maybe you can talk a little bit about this choice of hand coloring. The hand coloring, which you see over here on that wall, um, a little bit of story again, bear with me. Um, Van Leo, which probably most of you are familiar with, uh, was the one that influenced me to go towards hand coloring. And that happened with uh, when my wife and I went to get our portrait taken by the legend Van Leeuw, which we had heard about since, since years and years and years. And in January of 98, we went to have our portrait taken. And when we went to pick up the proofs a week later, uh, Van Leeuw announced that he was closing the studio. And from there, we began a friendship. And I started to really get to know his work. And a lot of the work was hand-colored. And one thing led to another. And you know, the hand-coloring industry was huge in Egypt because, you know, all the wars and things, there was always a black and white, but people wanted to be satisfied with reality. They wanted there to be color. So the whole colorizing industry uh, emerged very organic, lots of different colorists, because the photographers don't have time to do the coloring themselves. It takes too much time. You can spend a whole day on one picture. So uh, I asked him, uh, uh, I would like to try some hand coloring of my work. And he said, yeah, try Mamdua William. Mamdua William is the best. Because obviously Van Leo had tried all of them, Karop and uh, you name it, many, many different colorists. And Mandua William was still living. And he had used them for years and years and years. He said, I'll give you, I'll call him up and he'll give you a special price. So unlike all the studios that were coloring portraiture, I wanted to color cityscapes and desert. Well, that's really what differentiated me. And it turns out that when I went to meet him, he was pretty excited to do that work too because all his life he did portraits. So we began a really good relationship and I would go see him and, and he would colorize things for me. The only thing I didn't like was the way he did the green. His greens were really lousy. <laughs> <laughs> were there many other people like, like uh, Mamdouha William? There was lots. Mm. I mean, you know, by the time I started doing that, which was the late 90s, um, there were still people doing it, but it was really dying. So Mom Dewey William was really unique in that he was still active and, and um, but shortly thereafter, he emigrated to Australia. Well, and I should make one note. I had always asked him, because I wanted to start doing it myself. And what I feared most was happened. He left. So, but he never wanted me to watch him. 
He wanted to keep that trade secret private. So he left. So uh, I started doing it on my own. I <clears throat> read a lot of books and watched a lot of uh, webinars and YouTube and stuff like that. And I mean, he definitely he was a master of masters because it's really hard to duplicate the kind of quality that he did. And how did he learn? Well, he just learned, you know, probably when he was super young. And he learned from someone else, and that. And it, so this was a practice that all the studios were doing citywide. Yeah. This was global, actually. Yeah, global practice makes perfect. You know, one after another. And he learned that really the great flesh tones. I mean, the hardest thing was the flesh tones. And so then you started to learn and did your own coloring. And who else does coloring? Um, well, Yusuf Nabil is, is a really uh, well-known photographer that does coloring, too. Um, it's not easy to color, and you know, and the reason being all those studio photographers never colored is because it took so much of their time. They, you want to make new work. You don't want to sit there and color all day long. So that whole industry of the colorists uh, is thriving. Um, but I have done a lot of coloring, and I continue to thrive to work better. It's not easy. So, um, and you had, in your last show, the tour, you had some younger artists actually engage with you and hand color your work. So how was that giving it away again after having done it yourself? Well, that's right. Um, well, I, I cooperated with Dina Giardini and also Farah Hagazi. Uh, they they um, collaborated on maybe 15 each, 15 pieces. 40 by 50 and 50 by 60. And they, you know, everybody has their own style. Gina tended to be more uh, light and more pastelish, whereas Farah was bold and she intervened a lot in the, with opaque colors, opaque watercolors and opaque oil. Um, and since then, you've made a couple of series also where you're coloring and, and, and changing things a lot and taking a lot of liberty and going very abstract. Yeah, you know, I mean, when I was in university and when I was learning black and white as a serious medium for your practice, the gold standard was this gelatin silver print and, and no intervention whatsoever. So the thought to intervene by any means, uh, into the print was just uh, heretic, right? I mean, so, so the more that I started coloring, the more I started intervening, the more I lost that sacredness about the black and white print. Not so sacred anymore. And then, then when you start being really free with your imagination, with the coloring, um, anything goes. Because you have this tug of war in a way between the very classical approach and you know staying loyal to the beginnings of photography, even a portfolio you know like this kind of echoing that era, and then there's also the kind of the hyper contemporary in a way just being very abstract. So there's these two things that are happening. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. If I I thought about swinging into the image too. Because that's uh, something that I, I saw and I thought about a lot, but I haven't done that yet. So, uh, yeah, I mean, anything goes really. I mean, with the coloring, you can... Uh, actually, some of the prints that I did, you wouldn't even know there's a, a black and white image underneath, mm -hmm. just because you've altered the, the image so much. Well, thank you, Barry. Thank you for this uh, lovely... Uh you know, uh, revealing talk about your practice. Maybe uh, this is a, a good chance now to open it up to the audience. If you have any questions for Barry, we have a, a microphone that we can pass around so that it can be recorded. If you give people a moment to, to think. His memories of, of that precious book that you put. No, that. This one up there. Oh, the, portfolio. The, the portfolio, yes, yes. 
<clears throat> I, um, I started doing these albums after, after also as a result of my archival research, when I did a lot of research on 19th century photography, you find a lot of them uh, in the libraries and the museums, uh, illustrated albums with photographs. And they were lovely, uh, with interleaving tissue and uh, go uh, gold and marbled paper and stuff. So that's where I really started to actively make my own. And I found a bookbinder that did really nice work uh, as a bookbinder. So I would have him make the, the shell and according to the number of pages that I wanted. And he would make the slip case also and sometimes a little booklet <clears throat> to put into the slip case. And he would give me that shell and then I would proceed to dry my A lot of times if you just go ahead and you give the book binder 15, 20 prints, he's already got a messy workshop. Do you think those pictures are going to end up without glue or stuff on, on the top? So I was always really a bit wary of that. So I came to the conclusion that they would make me the, the complete album empty and then I would finish it. And that's how I did that. So I made several. I made like, <clears throat> I don't know, 10, 12 of, of these over, different, over a different period of time. And um, really enjoy it. Really enjoy making those albums. Because then you can determine the sequence, the first picture, the second, the third. Whereas in a gallery, someone might go over there first or they might go over here first, and you can't determine how they see the progression of the work. Thank you very much for your talk, I really enjoyed it. Um, I was just curious, first of all, to understand that your first work when coming to Egypt was to reinterpret the works of 19th century photographers that had gone before. And I'm just wondering whether 30 years on, where I believe you've lived here, whether your experience of living in Egypt and interacting with Egyptians changed your aesthetic somehow. You said that the 19th century photographers were somehow imprinted on you in the act of reproducing them. But I wonder whether your aesthetic changed completely just through life here, engagement with the country. Thank you. Yeah, interesting question. I mean, <clears throat> um, I spent my childhood in Alexandria. So, you know, when you, talk, when you talk about the foreign gaze, and I suppose it could be associated with the colonial gaze, um, it don't really fit that template just because I, I, I spent so many years here already and traveled widely in the region. That doesn't mean that I carry some of the baggage along. Um, but I suppose you could call it um, intimate detachment. How would I, how else would I put it? Um, I mean, you're, you're from a different culture, but you've been a culture for so, so long that it, it, it affects everything. So, I mean, you'll find a lot of artists that do work that, say for example, an Iranian artist immigrates to New York and they've been there 30, 40 years, a lot of times they still make reference back to the homeland. These motifs still coming back and coming back. Not saying everyone, but as to what kind of influences I have that keep coming back that came from America, uh, I don't know. I, I suppose, uh, if anything, it could be from the new topographics movement, but I'm not even so sure about that anymore. I was really involved with the new topographics movement um, in the late 70s, and that kind of stuck with me. But <clears throat> on the other hand, I pursued multiple projects 
over the years. And so I don't really get hung up on one certain thing. And I definitely don't get hung up on, on stuff like, uh, you know, uh, memories from Idaho or whatever. I, it, it, it never did have that. So much. That was really a pleasure. I'm wondering if you still have a relationship with Harvard, and if you don't, I'm wondering how you would possibly be able to establish some facility with them since you started your archival research there. It just seems like you would be an asset for Harvard's curating. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Well, um they can probably do without me. <laughs> they, they, they have enough on their own. Um, but it's true, uh, as I told you, I got completely involved with this project with Harvard. And I did a whole, whole project on Harvard while I was recovering. And in fact, before I came here to start the Comparative Views of Egypt, I did a major show at the Harvard Archives with that work and it went very well and they appreciated it so much because i had used all of their material um, just the last one was the when i was doing the comparative views uh, the shooting in the mid 80s um, during the fulbright grant uh, i had use of a fiat 128 so, and one trip to Alexandria, the front wheel kind of caved in, fell off. And that was kind of a funny incident. And um, you know how sometimes you, you drive along and you see an old taxi that the wheel has kind of fallen in? Well, that's what happened. So dangerous times. <laughs>